Check, check. Hello, hello, here we go with ecosystems. This is unit one, and uh, this begins our rapid review. So let's get going. All right, so let's first of all, just talk about a quick reminder about how ecosystems are built, right? So we have an individual, a population, which is all organisms of the same species interbreeding with each other. We have community, which are all the interacting biotic factors. And then lastly, we have ecosystems, which are the interacting biotic and abiotic factors. And then beyond that would be a biome and then a biosphere. So organisms can have a number of different types of interactions. Organisms can have commenced, or sorry, let me start with mutualisms, which is where both organisms benefit from the presence of each other. Organisms can have a commensalism, which is where one benefits and the other is not affected. They can also have a competition or a predation relationship. Let's look at some of those. So a predation relationship, there's really a bunch of different types of predation relationships. There's true predation relationship. There's an herbivore relationship, a relationship that an herbivore has with plants. There's a parasitic relationship. All of these are plus minus relationship. A parasitic is one where one organism preys on the other and the other is Im negatively impacted by it. Symbiotic relationship, this just refers to a relationship between two organisms. Awfully, uh, we refer to a positive-positive symbiosis as a mutualism. And coral is a really good example of that, where the coral provides the structure for the, um, the zooxanthellae, which are the photosynthetic algae, which live in the tissue of the coral. So this is a really good example of a mutualism to know. Another good example of a mutualism to know is lichen, where lichen is made from Alice algae and Freddie fungus. The algae does the photosynthesis and the fungus uh, provides the structure for the algae to live on. Competition. Competitions can result in what we call resource partitioning, which is where species use different, and I'm gonna use the term niches. You might not see that on the AP exam, but I think it'll help us understand thing um, to survive. And so it can be temporal partitioning, which is where they use uh, different, maybe the same place, but at different times of day, spatial partitioning where they're using different habitats um, or morphological uh, partitioning where they use different body parts so that maybe they have a different food source. We'll come back to food webs, um, but I do just want to remind you that the arrows in the food webs always move in the direction of the energy flow. So in this case, the Arctic cod is being eaten by the polar bear. Okay, so biomes. Uh, you should know a lot of those biomes that we covered just recently here um, and that organisms are adapted to live in biomes, everything from a rainforest to the taiga, temperate deciduous forest, grasslands, desert, tundra. Remember that at the northern and southern latitudes, you have your tundra with a lot of permafrost. You have your boreal forest, also known as your taiga. And then you have your more temperate latitudes in like the 30 to 60 range. Remember that at 30s, you get desert, 30 north and 30 south. And then a tropical location is close to the equator. We're talking about nutrient availability, right? We're really talking about the soil quality. Tropical rainforest, poor soil quality because decomposition is happening so fast. Temperate forest, 
have really good nutrient rich soil because you have lots of dead decaying things that are slowly um, decaying. And then something like a boreal forest or taiga actually also has a nutrient poor soil because it's so cold there that things decay so slowly. Remember that biomes are shifting. As climate change takes place, um, biomes will move to more northern and southern latitudes, something that we're already seeing happen. Aquatic biomes to know. So we have a lot of different aquatic biomes, but let's just talk about what they're based on here. And this is not something that necessarily I spent enough time covering. So let me take the moment now. So we can characterize aquatic biomes by their salinity, how deep they are, are they flowing, and their temperature. So freshwater rivers and lakes. There are several zones within a freshwater lake. There's the littoral zone, which is where you have emergent plants, plants sticking out of the water. It's right nearby the shore. Then there's the limnetic zone in a lake, or it's also called the photic zone because this is where light can reach, but there's typically not rooted plants here. The profundal is the deep dark zone. And then there's something called the benthic area, which the benthic is just another word for bottom. The bottom of the lake is the benthic zone. So this might be a good thing to take a note on. Wetlands, these are areas that are submerged in water for at least part of the year, right? And we've talked just recently on our field trip about all the ecosystem services of a wetland. They store excess water, they recharge groundwater, they can buffer storms, they can filter pollutants, and they're very, very productive ecosystems. These are examples of wetlands, swamps, marshes, bogs. And there's estuaries, which is this is where we have a mixture of fresh and salt water. Um, one really important estuary are um, salt marshes, a highly productive area um, in temperate climates, and then also mangrove swamps, which most of these mangrove swamps, which these are trees that grow in salt water and excrete the salt out of their leaves. Most mangrove swamps in the world have been cut down for shrimp farming. And these are some of the world's most important and productive ecosystems. And so there is a real push to save the world's mangroves. Coral reefs, obviously another really important um, um, aquatic ecosystem. Coral reefs are the most diverse of all reef systems, or sorry, of all uh, uh, marine and aquatic ecosystems. And uh, just to mention again, they have the photosynthetic algae, which live in their tissue, photosynthesizing um, and providing um, energy for the coral, and they get a place to live. Um, Many coral, just as a reminder, are being lost to the world to warming oceans. When it gets warmer, they expel their zooxanthellae and they bleach. Then there's intertidal zones. We spend some time in the intertidal zone um, for semester. And that's where we have things living that um, have skins that prevent them from drying out. And I'll move on from here since that's what we're most familiar with. And then we have the open ocean, the least productive area. Produces most of the world oxygen, but the density of the productivity is really low. And again, I'm going to pause because this is an important thing that we missed earlier on. And so in the ocean, you have benthic, which is bottom, benthic, which is bottom. Then you have the photic zone, which is where the light shines. And then you have the aphotic zone, which is where light does not shine. Some people will call it the abyssal zone, but I think a better term that you might see is aphotic. Okay, now we get into our cycles. And so I'd encourage you to just to spend some time. We've spent a lot of time with carbon, right? It comes uh, it's sequestered, taken in by plants during photosynthesis, or it can dissolve into the ocean, right? The ocean is a large sink of carbon. The largest terrestrial sink of carbon is going to uh, be limestone. Over time, that limestone can be suppressed um, or uh, compressed, I should say, and turned into fossil fuels. And then obviously respiration releases carbon into the atmosphere, as well as other human activities, such as combustion of fossil fuels and um, fires. Make sure you know the equations for photosynthesis and cellular respiration, um, and also how pH changes when carbon dioxide is dissolved in water. When carbon dioxide is dissolved in water, the pH goes down, making it more uh, acidic. 
And here's just a little bit more about the ocean and the carbon cycle. Remember that there's kind of a couple of ways that carbon can get into the ocean. One would be if it just dissolves directly into the ocean. Another way would be if algae absorb the carbon dioxide and take it out of the ocean or coral reefs absorb the carbon dioxide, um, or if marine organisms with calcium carbonate exoskeletons die and sink to the bottom. And we've talked a lot about extraction of fossil fuels, but uh, this is just showing that over time, these buried sediments can become fossil fuels and then they can be extracted and combusted and send back into the atmosphere. The nitrogen cycle. This is probably one that you need to spend a little bit of time on reviewing. Okay, so remember that we first have nitrogen fixation. That's when nitrogen from the atmosphere, N2, is brought into the form of NH3 and ammonium. It's done with lightning, bacteria, and remember that lagoons, the bacteria that live in the root nodules of lagoons. And then there's also synthetic nitrogen fixation, which is when we actually produce fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer. When the nitrogen is converted from NH3 or NH4 to NO2 and NO3, that's your nitrite and your nitrate, that is called nitrification. Assimilation is then when the plants absorb the nitrates or sometimes ammonia, and then it goes into the bodies of animals and it's turned back into ammonia, NH3, and that's called ammoniafication. At any step, the nitrogen can be turned back into the gaseous form by bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, and that's called denitrification. Humans have altered the nitrogen cycle. It is the most abundant element in the atmosphere. The main way that we've altered it is by fixing more nitrogen to make fertilizer, and that fertilizer has run off and caused eutrophication, cultural eutrophication when it's caused by humans. The phosphorus cycle. So remember that we use phosphorus for things like detergents um, and um, phosphorus is mostly contained in rocks. That's the major sink for phosphorus. And um, phosphate rocks can be weathered naturally or we can mine them. And phosphorus is unique in that it has no atmospheric component. So remember that it has no atmospheric component. It can also be mined for fertilizers because remember that in aquatic ecosystems, often the limiting nutrient is phosphates. And so that's why putting phosphates into water can also cause an algal bloom and cultural eutrophication. And this is just an example of eutrophication, which remember is when you put excess nitrogen or phosphorus into water, you get an algae bloom, that algae dies and decays. And then the bacteria, the aerobic bacteria use up the oxygen and you end up with a hypoxic zone or a dead zone. And so just knowing the important, the process of eutrophication is really important. And we spend a lot of time on that. Remember that if you're asked an FRQ about a reservoir, that just means like where it's stored. So if you were asked to give a reservoir of phosphorus. Um, you might give ocean sediments and rocks, for instance. And often you'll be given like a diagram like this, which will even help you figure that out. And so our last cycle, the hydrologic cycle, know that water evaporates, water can condense into clouds, then it can precipitate, it can hit the ground and undergo runoff. It can then go infiltration and percolation into the aquifer, and then it can move up through the roots of a tree and through a tree through evapotranspiration. The ocean is the largest reservoir of water, um, and but it's also obviously stored in the ground in lakes, rivers, and ice caps, but most of the water on earth is not usable um, as fresh water. So again, just make sure though, you know that word transpiration, which is when it's drawn through plants. Um, and then evapotranspiration is just the total amount that is drawn both from evaporation and through transpiration of plants. Remember that trees make it rain by putting uh, water into the atmosphere. That's why if you cut down the rainforest, it stops raining or it doesn't rain as much in that area and it can lead to desertification. Runoff, and when you have less infiltration, you have more runoff and vice versa. And we'll get into how humans alter the water cycle here. Okay, getting close to the end here. Primary productivity is in the units of um, energy per area per time. So 
kcals per meter squared per year. And basically it's the amount of photosynthesis that's happening in an ecosystem is what primary productivity is. And so there is an equation that you need to know. It's NPP, net primary productivity equals gross primary productivity minus respiration, right? So plants take in a lot of energy. That's the gross primary productivity and convert it to sugar. They use some of that for themselves. That's the respiration. What's left for the rest of the ecosystem is the net primary productivity. And so the amount that is of solar radiation that is absorbed is about 1% total. And the efficiency of the um, primary productivity process of the photosynthetic process is often higher than that. It could be anywhere from like five to 60%. And it depends on the ecosystem. And this is just a reminder that ecosystems with high productivity include swamps and marshes and tropical rainforests. And then low productivity are things like tundra and desert scrub. From a marine perspective, coral reefs and marshes have a really high productivity and the open ocean has a low primary productivity, not a high density of photosynthesis. And when we're talking about trophic levels, right? So remember that first law of thermodynamics, energy is never created or destroyed. Second law, when it passes up a trophic level, um, energy is often lost as heat. And so you often get a food pyramid problem here, and you just need to know that there's more energy on the bottom, right? And let's just make sure we know what the bottom is. The bottom is going to be our producers, right? And then above the producers, you're going to have your primary consumers, then your secondary consumers, and then lastly on the top, you have your tertiary consumers, and 10% of the energy is passed on to each level, while 90% is lost as heat on average. This is also true of the mass of the pyramids. So if you asked a question about why you couldn't have more organisms on the top or higher biomass on top, you would refer to the 10% rule. And that is just what we're seeing in this calculation right here. We lose 10, we lose 90% of the energy with each step up. Okay. When you're drawing a food chain or web, just make sure the arrows are going in the correct direction of the energy flow, right? What's being eaten by what? You could have a food chain or a food web um, and often these food webs become very interconnected and you'll get things like trophic cascades, which happen when you have like a keystone species, such as a wolf or a whale, that if they're lost from the ecosystem, the entire ecosystem might collapse because those are regulating organisms. Okay, and that is it for unit one. So take care, everybody. Hope that was helpful.